Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kara Holm. I'm the Advancement Director. My team is uh, looking after producing this uh, wonderful film festival event with uh, the Alumni Association, and I'm really excited to be introducing this industry panel about starting your career in film. Um, we have uh, Aaron Langell from the NASCAD Creative Entrepreneurship Lab, who also happens to be an alumna. Um, she's going to be moderating this talk, and then she is joined by Stephen Reynolds, Laura McKenzie from Screen Nova Scotia, Jason Buxton, Jason Levanji, and I think I've got everybody. And I would just like to say everybody but Laura is a NASCAD alumnus. So you've got a good representation of, <laughs> of what you can do with a NASCAD degree. And with that, I will turn it over to Erin. And thank you very much for being here. Thanks, Kara. Um, I'm going to do a very quick introduction so that we know where each of your sort of career centers are. Um, Laura currently serves as the film commissioner and executive director of Screen Nova Scotia, a film commission industry promotion and advocacy association. She's held such positions as director of the Atlantic International Film Festival, Finn Part and Finn Partner, sorry. And Jason Levanji, that's second down, you can wave there. Uh, he's the director and creative producer based in Halifax, Nova Scotia, and co-owner of Shut Up and Color Pictures, a boutique production company that develops and produces a slate of feature films. He's been a music video director in Canada since 2004. Jason Buxton is a Canadian film director and screenwriter. He wrote and directed three short films, A Fresh Start, The Garden, and The Drawing, before debuting his first full-length feature film, Blackbird, in 2012, which was nominated for two awards at the first Canadian Screen Awards, including a nomination for Best Original Screenplay. It was also a co-winner alongside uh, Brandon Cronenberg's Antiviral of the Best Canadian First Feature Film Award at the Toronto International Film Festival. And then finally, there's Stephen Reynolds. He's the new business agent for the Directors Guild of Canada, the Maritimes Regional Council um, Division. Take. Yes, yes, uh, in Halifax. Um, he has an impressive list of director and producer credits spanning feature films to drama, comedy, and children's programming. programming. And he made his first film debut with the award-winning film, The Divine Ryans, which shared the People's Choice Award at the Palm Springs International Film Festival. And that shared with uh, Crouching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. Mm -hmm. Some people know that movie. Um, so the very first question that I had, um, if you can reach back into your minds, which was, what was your very first interest in film? Did it happen pre-NASCAD, pre-university, and did you come come into your schooling already with a vision of getting into film or did you um, did that spark at some other later journey and if anybody wants to go first you can start but I'd love to hear from each of you I'll uh, jump right in good afternoon everybody um, I was uh, I um, originally out of Ontario came here as a kid in the early 60s and my first introduction to film was through a filmmaker by the name of Bill McGilvery who was my high school art teacher at Halifax West and he brought in Lionel Simmons and uh, Ken Pittman and a few other local artists to illustrate to his class um, the notion of motion pictures. And uh, amongst the uh, weed-hazed world of high school in the 70s, um, <laughs> it sowed a seed. And that seed manifested itself about six or eight years later when I decided to come back to school and went to NASCAD here in the late 70s and early 80s. And as I took a degree in photography and mixed media, I discovered the fine art of A, B, and C, or rather... A beginning, a middle, and an end. And all my photographic work began to take just the form of uh, three panel pieces. And oh, I started writing words on the image. Oh, I started write, oh, I started telling stories. And at the, uh, at the same time, I met and married my first wife and had our first child, and that automatically said, Steve, get a job. <laughs> and in that world of get a job, I thought, how do I transition from an art college storytelling desire where I would have no uh, economic prospects whatsoever how do I go ahead and uh, make a living? So I discovered very swiftly in that journey while at NASCAD, the roles and uh, responsibilities of filmmakers. 
And one of the biggest things I learned, of course, was that film, unlike painting or sculpture or uh, <clears throat> photography, it's not an independent or single artistic practice. It's a collaboration, it's a teamwork. And I learned to become an AD very swiftly and got my first job and the, as they might say, the rest is history. Anyone else? Thank you. Sure, I'll go next. Um, I think for me, well, I used to draw when I was very young and used to draw stories, uh, moving images. But when I was 15, uh, it was really like VCR to VCR, <laughs> pirating of movies that and that's what I did at that time and, and it's sort of like it transferred for me from from drawing comics to wanting to tell moving images through film and uh, yeah for me it was when I was 15 and I became I, I just started to consume everything that I could get my hands on at the video store I became a huge Humphrey Bogart fan and Really loved American uh, cinema of the 1970s. And kept going from there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. Uh, my story is like pretty much exactly the same as the other Jasons, so <laughs> it's not very interesting. But yeah, I think I wanted to draw comic books up to the about the age of 15. I had like a five month delusion that I might be a musician until I realized everyone around me who was way better at it than me. Uh, but always played with cameras and always. I think I did my first stop motion animation when I was 11, maybe. And so came here not really knowing what I wanted to do other than I loved cameras, photographic and video. And uh, But always was sort of a latchkey kid who lived the block from Park Lane and went to every movie that was in the theater. So was a cinephile pretty early on. And I think I figured out by the, about 18 or 19 that I wanted to make movies. I never wanted to be a starving artist ever in my life. <laughs> it never occurred to me. Um, so I was all business all the time. I went to the Mount, did a business degree, and then uh, went into a program where you became a general manager of a hotel after two years of specific training. Moved out to Calgary and thought that's where my life was going to go. Um, and then I became a general manager of a hotel at 26 years old, and it was the worst. I hated it. It was so awful. <laughs> Um, so I decided to move home to Halifax and I just fell backwards into a film community. And I just remember like being surrounded by these people that were so incredibly passionate about working together with this sort of common goal, uh, to do this. And it was so fun. Um, and I thought, okay, well, we'll give this a try. And here I am, you know, 20 years later, that's about it. Thank you. Um, just for those who actually went to NASCAD, can you talk about um, maybe a class, a professor, some kind of project that happened while you were here that maybe sent you on your way or you think of <laughs> an exact moment where you're like, this is where I was really like um, keying into my sort of film understanding? I'll answer that. I think um, two things. Um, you know, a number of classes taught by this man, uh, I think, gave me a, like a grounded understanding of the what I wanted to do because I think that the I was in the first graduating class of the film program, quote unquote, and I think we we're all kind of figuring out what that meant over the course of those two years. But I knew that uh, people wrote things on paper and then you turned it into a movie but I think because Sam had practical experience as an art director and a set designer I guess in, in Quebec like I feel like I had yeah and so I just had a different like I tapped into maybe not a specific class but more like tapped into like oh there are my one the one person I knew other than that was like I worked with a, a, a cinematographer uh, my first day on set was uh, doing like travel cooking shows because my parents were in the restaurant industry <laughs> And my, my father's best friend growing up was a production designer who built all the sets for Theodore Tugboat. But I didn't really like know all the other aspects. And so I think that being in that building across all the classes when sort of 12 people, two years intensive was, was sort of instrumental. And also Media Arts with Kathleen Tedlock, I would say, who taught me Media 100 and uh, like solid state drives and layering footage and like how to play with video and digital as a medium, I think was instrumental in sort of the next 20 years of me making weird little music videos. 
Uh, well, I was here sort of in two stints. I was here originally in 92. Um, and at that time, there was very little film. There was uh, one eight millimeter film course, which was three credits. And, and then right after that, it was 60 millimeters, both taught by David Middleton. Um, and I, I took both of those courses and um, having already wanted to be a filmmaker at that point, I wanted more. So then I went west to Simon Fraser University where I studied uh, for a couple of years uh, before starting to work in the industry as a camera assistant in Halifax. Um, but I would say the teacher, the most influential in retrospect was Gerald Ferguson, who said to me, uh, or everybody, <laughs> um, make an art is 95% perspiration and 5% inspiration. I was too young to understand that at the time, but in retrospect, it's, it's um, sage advice, mm -hmm. really, yeah. Uh, my influences were uh, here, were uh, like Gary Wilson in the photo department and Alvin Commodore, and I think Bob Bean was a kind of a classmate at the time. Um, but I was also um, a student of Bruce Barber's at the time, so being introduced to different media uh, and working outside the box of just photography and what was uh, communicating a message all about um, were significant influences on me. But I, uh, I took the motto of the school, heart, head, and hand, uh, very personally. And so I was keen um, about learning the crafts of whatever I was uh, taking that particular semester, or sub a series of semesters, and I was keen on trying to read about it, and I was keen about whatever th I was trying to do uh, was inspired or heartfelt. Um, and subsequently, historically, if we look back at, uh, I don't know, maybe 100 or 120 hours of directing work that I've done, a great chunk of it has been around uh, comedy, and around kids, and uh, both are emotional highs, you know, laughter and sorrow, of course, and uh, uh, the emotion of children is, uh, seems to be, uh, uh, you know, a, such a wide palette to uh, play in. So all of those were inspired uh, here by uh, both professors and, and the school itself. Thank you. Um, kind of leaning into something that a uh, number of you have said already. All of you are in sort of directorial roles now, except for Laura. I mean, you're in a director role, but in, <laughs> in a business sense. But um, you've also mentioned that you had a camera position or some other kinds of uh, roles in film. And um, as John had said earlier, the film industry is a collaborative approach to um, sort of visionary making work. And um, I just wanted to know if you were giving advice to someone who was starting out, I think they often think of the director role as the thing that they want to hit, but how do you get there? Is it advisable to start in these other departments or how do you move through, is it easy to move through those departments into a directorial role eventually, or do people, um, take a wrong path and get stuck in locations or something for years on end. I think all of the above. I mean, it, it really depends on the individual. I think everybody has a different path and the path that makes more sense for some people is not to work in the industry and just to start directing and continue on that path. For me, um, and I needed to get out of camera assisting because I it was, I think, a frustrated director, and it, it came out, and I look back that I uh, unconsciously sabotaged my camera assistant career because I, I was simply not happy. And But that said, uh, and this is where I met uh, Stephen, actually, because I would mark his actors when he was directing early in, in the days when I started uh, camera assisting. But I think really it's uh, it gave me... Uh, being in the camera department, especially, it gave me uh, um, just that to be at the center of film production. It was indispensable in terms of what what lessons I learned and just the knowledge I had about how how to run a set and how what everybody does. I think that was the key thing for me. So I can walk on a set 
And if I haven't made a movie in a long time, I just have that knowledge. And so that, that for me was worked really well, but I, I had to dip in and dip out. Yeah, I think there's, it's a complex question because I mean, there's no, I think that definitely by virtue of trying positions on a film set, you'll find out whether you're cut out for it in general. I think not everyone can deal with the feast or famine nature of, you know, the sudden 60 day summer camp intensity with a like highly organized group of a hundred plus people. And then what's next for months on end. I think that the instability of that is, is challenging for some people. So on a basic sense, doing some work on a film set, I think is crucial to understand whether the mechanism is right for you or, or whether you want to be part of post-production or be an animator or be a writer or be in the production office working nine to five, doing something on an organizational or administrative level, but whether or not uh, it takes you off track of those above the line positions, I would say, you know, are you independently wealthy? Because <laughs> if, if, if yes, then don't bother being a location manager. Uh, but if, if the answer is no, then, you know, I think I've seen it happen every single way where, you know, some people, there are actors out there who choose to work seasonally at, NASC, at Neptune as, a, as an usher or, or there are musicians who tour in the fall and the winter and then they are a grip on a, on a movie set in, in the summer. And people find those balances and those cadences that work for them but it's never cut from some kind of formula that you can hear in a how-to video on Instagram. Like you have to find it and sort of decide whether you want to invest the mental and emotional energy and aspects of the, of the craft of making and the business of making films. And then probably at some point figure out what you want to say no to so that you can get to where you want to be. I would, I would jump in there too. Yeah. Because I never wanted to be a director, um, but I do understand what it looks like to um, to start in the film industry and to and to work your way into it, and I think um, the real answer is somewhere between what I'm going to say and what they've said. But um, you know, it is a community, and if people don't want to work with you, then you'll never make your way. So the best piece of advice is, um, I'm not suggesting that you shouldn't have boundaries, but you have to be open, uh, willing and have a good attitude and just do whatever you can to get on set and work with people that you want to work with. Because at the end of the day, if, you know, if people don't want to work with you, you're never going to make it. This is a small community. It's got to be fun. It's got to be exciting. It's got to be something that um, you're all, you know, similarly aligned and where you're going. And, and that's what's going to make it a good project. Like if you want to be a director and you're going to strategically maneuver your way through, you know, the Nova Scotia film community to find your way to being a director, um, you know, as soon as possible, you're going to have to burn a couple bridges along the way and that's probably not going to work out. So I just would say, um, be really open-minded and, and make sure that, um, you know, learning how to walk in someone else's shoes is something you've, you, you, you take very seriously because once you become a director, um, then you want to make sure you understand that, you know, the plight of the location manager um, once you're there. So, you know, I treat it like you would, you know, any community you want to be part of when you're uh, on your uh, ascendancy. And make sure you want to be a director. It's like <laughs> good. It's, a, it's like a nice idea in theory because you see them at the helm. But I think having experience on a film set can show you maybe you're more actually more interested in different aspects of it that your your practical skills apply to the collective venture of making a film in a way that makes you happier if you decide to be a sound recordist or a first assistant director or an editor you know i think yeah i mean you uh, as it's been mentioned already the the role of delegation if you can't do those things or if you can't let go of minutia that should be someone else's job. That might not be the best role for you. If you're too much of a control freak in terms of a director's position, it might be a hindrance because you do have to work as a com community and let people shine in the roles that they're in. I would say it's, there's all kinds of <laughs> yeah, directors sure who all... are successful. <laughs> like there are, I've worked with multiple directors who don't care about the millimeter of a lens who don't even look at the monitor necessarily, but are just very much engaged with the performers. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there are some directors who come to it from a very technical perspective that the person they talk to the most is the cinematographer 
that all they care about is which lenses and locking for two cameras and even understanding the difference between being a documentary director, a feature film writer, director, and a television director, they're almost three completely different skill sets and different like levels of energy and ability to answer questions on a minute to minute daily basis. Like, I don't know if, if you watch more TV than, than film, that's a really for a good indication that you're not probably not a writer director, I would say. Well, you've had um, all, you've worn all those hats. Can you speak to the different kinds of directing? I, um, I can to a great degree, <laughs> which is, uh, I've been very, very fortunate. And uh, I would just echo that what they've all said is all critical and important. And uh, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Levangi, and the, and the detailing of those choices that one makes. And I think <clears throat> to Laura's remark about conviction and passion and uh, uh, willingness to learn are all critical. Um, uh, working with your elders and learning and picking up uh, is all vital. Um, I make mention of the heart, head, and hand earlier uh, purposely in that it kind of reflects uh, the focus that one might take for any of the uh, let's say the big three, we'll say uh, a feature film writer, director, a TV series, uh, episodic director, and then a, a you know comedy or variety or a TV studio director. And I've had the good fortune of doing all. Um, <clears throat> in fact, my very first uh, <clears throat> learning experience was at NSCC after Bill McGilvery in animation uh, in high school was as a TV director and learning to what three cameras were and how to call it in a live uh, news broadcast, for instance. Um, that manifested itself in directing 22 minutes for eight years. And that was a, a film style shooting for the sketches and multiple camera shooting with 250 people in the audience live to tape and calling it with audio, sound and graphics all simultaneously. Um, they take uh, different uh, skill sets, but the uh, fundamental things that everybody was referring to here is really where you start at. And as you're starting out here in NASCAD and you're, uh, you're interested in color or you're interested in shape or you're interested in sound or you're interested in being a director, the best thing you can do, and <clears throat> I think Mr. Carr has kind of made a reference around it and said, you know, you don't have to, as a director, know this guy's job or that person's job or their things. <laughs> But damn it, does it ever help? And <laughs> in my world, that is what I, my first 10 or 12 years in this business was learning everybody else's business. And I got to work as an AD first off. And then as I AD'd, I ended up sitting in a, a music video company called Champagne Motion Pictures. I ended up working on 100 or 120 different music videos with Corey Hart and Brian Adams and, you know, na list them off from the mid late 80s. To, I directed Kim Mitchell's Patio Lanterns every summer. It comes on and I go, ah. <laughs> and I didn't direct for 15 oh, Thank you. Thank you very much. It's a very popular song. I didn't direct for 15 more years after the uh, video came out. Part and parcel of that, the background behind that story is this: I got hired then to work on the commercial side. Oh, Steve, you did really great. Come on over and do an SO Protect oil commercial. And then I'm standing there and I'm doing take 29 with six other directors from the creative house behind me on a crane shot of a guy walking out and pouring some oil into their engine. And on take three, I had a great take. And 29 came, 31, 33, and the day is over. Thank you very much. And we ended up using take three in the cut. And I said, I'm not interested in that kind of work. I'm interested in telling stories and working with people who have great stories to tell. And that's, uh, <clears throat> that was my kickoff then and to realize that uh, the story, the beats, the elements of, um, of uh, what you're trying to communicate and who you're working with um, <clears throat> became more important to me in, uh, my career, and then that manifested itself in becoming a full-time director. I want to talk about the story, the storytelling aspect to um, filmmaking in a second. But first, I wanted to talk, Laura, about um, and Jason had kind of mentioned it in terms of stability, career stability, and that often there's short contracts that are super fun, like. Uh, summer camp kind of vibe, but there's a larger picture in the industry in terms of the fluctuation with tax credits and policy making. And 
several years ago when there was a change in government and a change in taxes, it really affected the industry at large. And I just wanted you to talk about just film career stability on an individual level. Like I know that, you know, a year might look different one to the next, mm -hmm. but how does your job and other kinds of union activities or other kinds of um, policy making affect career stability in film? Sure. Well, um, for those of you that were around for 2015, you probably have a pretty good idea of how policy affects your livelihood. Um, but uh, when the Liberal government dismantled the film tax credit, as well as the Film Commission, uh, work, you know, for all intents and purposes, did go away. Um, now, there was an incentive that was put in its place, but we had done such a good job of spreading the message that we were closed for business that it took a really long time to turn that messaging around. And it took the whole community to do it. You know, it took uh, messaging from Screen Nova Scotia. It took traveling out to market and sitting down in front of the studios and telling them that we were open for business. And it took our filmmakers making good content and sharing it with the, with the world so that they could actually physically see that we were still making content. And that took a long time to turn around. Now that it has been turned around, um, it really is just this constant game of making sure that the politicians and the bureaucrats understand the value of your industry. So there's never a moment in my life when I'm not concerned about making sure that somebody understands the value of, of Nova Scotia's film industry, the economic benefit, the job growth, um, what we have to offer. You know, I'm selling it internally and I'm selling it externally. You know, I think that's not just Screen Nova Scotia's responsibility, it's also the unions and guilds. We do a trade mission every year with the unions and the guilds and Stephen and I traveled to Los Angeles this year together with the premier to talk to the studios about our investment in the industry and the premier's investment in the industry. It's really important that you continue to stay on the radar. As soon as you walk out the door, you're no longer on the radar. So you have to constantly be engaging with the studios and making sure that they know who you are and what your growth plans are. Um, you really just can't stop. You have to continue. It always, always has to be happening. I'm not sure that answers your question, no, but that... really it's just like, you know, for me, that is my life. It's my, it's my job. My job is to make Laura sure. Laura saved us. <laughs> uh, yeah. here. Um, uh, the early board of directors of Screen Nova Scotia saved the industry. Um, there was uh, an, a board of directors that came together um, to form Screen Nova Scotia, which really sort of rose out of the ashes of film and creative industries Nova Scotia. And that board of directors in the chair sat in the legislature with the leaders of the opposition at the time and all of the politicians and all of the MLAs um, that they could muster and gather. Um, and they fought back um, and that was sort of the beginning. But now it's, you know, it's like the sand and we need to get inside the rocks and we need to get the water inside the sand and we need to ingrain ourselves into, um, into sort of the economics of this province. And not just the economics, but also the culture. You know, we need to be a great place to live. We need to be a fun place to live. We need tourism to recognize how they can leverage and harness the film industry to share that messaging internationally. So we need to be really smart and creative about how we ingrain ourselves in this province. And, uh, and that's what we do over at Screen Nova Scotia. Thank you. Um, on an individual level, how did you fare with, or how do you fare with those kinds of career fluctuations in terms of work that's available or um, making work and finding support with um, your ideas and productions? I'll just quickly add, uh, make one remark to that. Yeah, uh, of course. I uh, failed to say earlier that one of the things after uh, university and starting into this industry that I recognized at that time so it's 83, 84, 85, that the amount of work that's been referenced here uh, couldn't support me as a, uh, uh, in a living wage. And so I got on the bus, got on the plane and went to Toronto and <clears throat> went to work there. And then anytime something was opening here, I came back home. So I ended up <clears throat> skating between the two parks <clears throat> uh, for a good part of my career. And now, as I'm on the backside of the directing, giving up the floor, I've stepped into the Directors Guild of Canada, recognizing that the region here, uh, <clears throat> although small, is mighty and has a fabulous history, a bigger history than many of the places that I've worked in right across the country, Manitoba, Alberta, for instance. We've been around longer and have fought stronger for the success and health of our industry here. 
So the Directors Guild of Canada has always recognized that, and we were one of the first uh, satellites from the National or Ontario, Quebec, and BC, then Nova Scotia, through the Atlantic Regional Council was born. Then the others followed in, the other provinces followed in behind. And uh, so in that regard, it is, <coughs> uh, uh, some of the things we're trying to do is around training, is around uh, opening up or trying to, uh, <clears throat> within the context of fair working conditions, we're looking at trying to uh, uh, sort of standardize how uh, young people get into the industry. Not trying to limit them by any means, but it's things like just mandatory courses like set fundamentals or art department fundamentals, uh, uh, things of this nature, locations, fundamentals, locations being laughed at earlier, but is one of the conduits that many people get into. And it gives you a, a 360 degree view of the landscape of a professional film set or television set. And wow, what a great place to just start and get opened up to. The locations managers complain about continually losing their location PAs to other departments <laughs> because they realize, oh, wait, I came through NASCAD. I was uh, <clears throat> wanting to do this or I was building those or I was <clears throat> whatever you were doing, working in, with a lens, working with <clears throat> imagery, lighting, etc. And those, right, that gives you the door to see and meet people, work with and share in the experience and then formalize or try to pick your own direction. Sorry. sorry no, that's shut, okay. Shut off a little bit there. <laughs> Um, just to go back a little bit, did you uh, fare okay in the change in 2015 or how have you had to work outside of the province and how do you balance those kinds of things? Were you able to make a career here the entire time? And what would your advice be to someone who is graduating to try and um, move forward with the work? Are you following the work around the country or are you trying to start projects here? Well, for me, I'm kind of stubbornly uh, a writer director. Um, and because of that, it's been financially really tough. And I sort of look back on my trajectory where um, I look back now and I think, you know, there's a sort of attrition that happens where it's the last people standing, you know, unless you're independently wealthy, like Jason referred to it. Like <laughs> if somebody's independently wealthy, then you can, uh, you know, stick with it and, and not do these other things that can be a distraction. But, uh, you know, it's so hard. Uh, my last film was, uh, we shot it 12 years ago. Um, and luckily in this country, we have uh, development. So that helps uh, keep one afloat. But it's incredibly hard. It's incredibly hard to, to stay focused. And, you know, uh, policy changes all the time, not just on the provincial level, but um, Telefilm Canada. They're constantly changing uh, their focus and their financing. And so uh, what benefits somebody coming out of a movie like I had, um, where I had a development slate for a while, and, and those things keep changing. So you just, sometimes you're lucky, sometimes you're unlucky, depending mm -hmm. on the timing. But it's really just, uh, you know, sticking to it. Um, I probably would have been better off if I had, uh, you know, done other things during this time. But um, it's just the way my brain works. And I, I focus on one task and until it's done, if it takes 10 years. That's wonderful. Uh, yeah, it's, it's such a range. Like, it is, I think... It's interesting, like you, when I graduated from NASCAD, uh, there was a lot less work being done here in terms of number of days of shows being shot or number of production dollars being spent. Um, I think typically in a year these days, we're what, up over $220 million worth of production spend most years. Is that I mean, we're, whatever? We're, we're probably gonna hit probably 180, 200. Yeah. So, and so there's more work than there was, you know, 15, 20 years ago uh, and more opportunities, I think, to find those entry level positions that Stephen was talking about. Um, but we're a smaller piece of the pie in Canada overall because of just the amount of content being created. And I think that extends to independent contractors doing content for on a contract basis, whether it's commercial work or editorial work or whatever the case may be. So, 
there's because of technology and because of the web, basically there's an ever increasing um, uh, desire for storytelling with pictures, uh, whether it's animation or with cameras or whatever the case may be. And so I think that there is like, you can be optimistic about there being more solvency or more consistency getting into this industry now than maybe ever before. Mm -hmm. Um, now that may have plateaued in this like crazy Netflix, Disney boom of the last three years. And now they're kind of looking at themselves being like, we got to check this a little bit, but I think that it's, (laughs) it's been, it's sort of, um, the opportunities are there. And I think that if you're looking to stay in Halifax and stay in Nova Scotia, you're always going to need to be a little bit more diverse, a little bit more scrappy, a little bit more of a hustler to find the different opportunities. But I think that makes for really well-rounded film technicians and artists and personnel. Whereas if you, (coughs) anybody in this room could probably move to Vancouver, uh, in the next week or two and find an entry level position on a, on, on, on a particular team and never stop working for a decade. Uh, even though they might be slowing down as a comparison to last year, or whatever the case may be literally, we're going to build our f- first film studio soundstage here in the next 20 months. And they're going to build another 16. <laughs> um, and so of, of course those numbers mean a certain thing in terms of like what it's like to live in Halifax versus what it's like to live in Vancouver. But, I would say your cost of living is also a fraction. Your quality of life in terms of whether you can go home for lunch on any given day is different. And uh, if you're if you have the resolve that this is the thing that you want to do, then you'll find. I, I recommend that everyone do a basic two tiered approach. Find your tribe of people that you want to make things with, regardless of how much money it makes you or not and then find your way into working in some facet of the industry. And that could be a lot of things that could be working at Neptune. It could be being a, doing the door at Shakespeare by the sea to learn about theater. Like it doesn't necessarily all have to be the film industry, but I, but uh, we certainly, you know, between the four or five different production companies that are doing service work and Canadian content through the summers here, there's approaching, we're looking, we're trying to have, as much as three, maybe four, what we would call full crews in in Nova Sco- in Halifax or in Nova Scotia, let's say. And so we need people to come in and be interested in being in the union and not stop knocking on this guy's door being like, I want to be a trailer AD. I want to be a script supervisor. I want to, or going to 849 and saying, I want to know what it means to be a sound recordist on set. It makes, it makes a huge difference to like the, everybody's future. And we're all kind of like, in it together for that reason. Um, This is a bit of a pivot, but uh, can you talk about what a typical day looks like um, and then a typical day in your actual, like your shooting at that time? Because I know that the film industry is some days you're doing one thing and some days you're not doing that. So that you're in pre-production or you're gestating ideas or seeking out funding but if you were to describe a typical day in your career to someone who's thinking about going into the film industry how how would you do that or maybe there's only atypical days <laughs> you can describe an atypical day i mean i think you i can like speak for myself as a i think the reason that i'm a producer uh is because i don't like sitting still and so when you're a producer, you have the, op- I, I, I came to it by being a music video director and the roster of talent that I was on in Toronto, I was their first call. Anytime they were trying to shoot anything east of Montreal, I'd be like, who do I go to, to production manage this thing I want to do? And I was like, there's no one. <laughs> uh, so I started becoming that person and I started producing more than I was directing. And, uh, you know, obviously like anybody, you have some trepidations around that because they like, oh, you want to be the creative leader or whatever the case may be. But I think because I have sort of embraced this creative producing and, produ- and the production management side of, of creation, I've had twice as much time in the saddle as I would have otherwise. And it's just like being an assistant director uh, or being a production designer, whatever the case may be, you get a really clear window into what the barriers are for filmmakers and in terms of getting their projects financed, getting their projects properly developed, building the skill sets that they need to do what they're supposed to do on the day and up to that point. And so I think that 
that's a long way of saying like the, the way I spend my day in February is going to be completely different than the way I spend my day in August. I spend way more time at the computer than I would like, but there's a lot of great parts of it too, where seasonally you travel to a lot of markets, travel to a lot of film festivals. If you're building the ship, then you're spending time connecting with the, the world of, of independent filmmaking, trying to figure out how things are getting made not now, but next year and five years from now so that you can sort of future-proof your intentions. Um, so it, it's just sort of like a seasonal thing where he might be like writing and not move for three months and then he's gonna have in 11 days, 17 people like asking him questions nonstop for a month. <laughs> Are then... you shooting something in 17 days? <laughs> uh, we're in pre-production right oh. now. Um, Can you talk about that? Future. Maybe as a as a living example of what a... Sure. Um, uh, well, the movie we're shooting is called Sharp Corner. It's a movie that I started writing uh, 10 years ago. Uh, we were sort of uh, geared up to make it just before the pandemic. Then the pandemic happened and, and uh, here we are three years later. Um, we're in uh, pre-production. We... We're building a house on location. Uh, the movie is about um, a family that moved to a, sharp, a house on a sharp corner, only to soon realize that every two, three months is a major accident at the corner where people end up dying on their front lawn. Mm. And the lead character, uh, the male, he wants to save the lives of these uh, car accident victims. So we location scouted in, I guess, Three years ago, April 2020, first time I ate out with a with a without a mask on. Yeah, uh, that only only time. And and we discovered that we couldn't find the right perfect corner with with perfect house, so we had to either build a house on a corner or build it all. And we found a corner that worked, that we're able to control traffic, and so we've built a house that is near done. I would say a couple of weeks from now and and uh it's our on-set location that we're going to shoot uh 75 percent of the movie there oh, wow. so right now yeah it's um it's a lot of uh, meetings and, and talking with everybody and we, we you know we're set up at the production office but my life part of that is i go to a coffee shop i, I sit down in a corner i start talking to myself and people think i'm crazy <laughs> That's typically, typically my, uh, my life. Um, so uh, you didn't mention, is it a full-length film? It is. It's a feature film. And um, has it been, ca like, in when you say pre-production, has it been cast and everything? Are you... Uh... We're in the process okay. of casting it right now. Yeah. And what, can you talk about that role, like your role in that? In the casting? Yeah, I mean, like, <laughs> as... <laughs> uh, sure. Um well, our finance, our financing model um, requires uh, that we um, we have I, I don't know how you'd say it like a, um, like a certain an people care certain who value. the star of your movie is at, when you're working at a certain level. Yes, uh, yeah. and so so we're just going through that list right now. Yeah. Okay, making offers. Yeah. Oh, cool. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very cagey over here I know. <laughs> that's a I mean, it's, a it's a year-long journey for us it's like you know it's in the world of um there being two giant agencies that control 98 percent of the talent that anybody in this room would recognize and this long line of productions that are trying to be made and streaming uh it's a very different world than it was 10 years ago in terms of being able to court talent uh, to do an independent film because everyone's very cognizant of building out their brand. Um, and so, you know, I think, uh, and at the same time, independent sales companies and distributors are more risk averse than ever before. And so um, we're very lucky to live in Canada where we can build out um, work with organizations like Telefilm and Canadian Media Fund and uh, and then also core broadcasters who are interested in buying the brilliant words on the page. Uh, and then you still like need to find a, another piece that usually will come from the marketability of your film. And so as much as we might just want to turn around and cast an emerging talent from Nova Scotia that was just perfect for the role or that their audition leapt off the screen, that's a full stop for someone who doesn't 
uh, someone in Los Angeles or someone in Stockholm who like has never heard of that person and can't yeah. figure out what they would be worth in cable sales in Lithuania. They want a bankable name. Yeah. Yeah. Um, we're going to get close to the question period. So I just wanted to ask one last very general question, which is what kind of advice would you give an aspiring filmmaker from NASCAD, say someone in the audience right now in terms of moving into the film industry? Go to YouTube and watch this panel. <laughs> Just zoom back, find out what those two said over there. <laughs> really important. I'm kind of kidding, but kind of not. We've kind of hit on a few things if you, <clears throat> that I think are very important, and that is um, <clears throat> take your passion with you when you leave here. Um, <clears throat> have a willingness to listen and uh, react accordingly to <clears throat> what uh, is being offered. <clears throat> Uh, if there is something, and if there is not something being offered, uh, <clears throat> don't stop looking. Don't stop asking. Networking is, uh, Jason's remark here was, uh, networking is fundamentally what starts at the bottom and that tribe that you find and those people that you start to talk to and work with and figure out and then, oh, that first job or that second job or that part-time job is that networking continues through time and it continues tremendously through time. It's, Jason and I shook hands here moments ago at the start of this. He reminded me that he first met me through my son drinking beer. And I was, oh, okay, all right. <laughs> Flashback. Not that we've worked together since, but it, the point is, is that there is connectivity and that I've seen right across the country from working from BC to Newfoundland. I would say um, become a production accountant. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Drop what you're doing. Drop right. everything right now and become a production accountant. You'll be uh, employed every day of your life. Um, and then, you know, in your off time, you can, uh, you know, do, you can, you can do what, you know, drives you. Um, but I, I think, you know, my actual piece of advice is even if you want to become a director, if that's your ultimate goal, um, follow the money. You still need to think like a producer. You still need to know where your money is coming from. Um, and to understand uh, what are the nuances or the complexities that are going to trigger trigger that funding. So if you, you know, know that you want to be a future filmmaker, well, you need to find out every single pot of money that's available to you in Canada and how you can let that money work for you and play together. Because sometimes you can get some telefilm funding, but it's not going to play well with another type of funding. So I would say become an expert in in understanding where the money is and and what's going to allow you to put together, um, you know, the best possible financing structure. You know, the world has changed a lot over the last couple of years. And I'm not saying that, you know, white men can't make movies anymore. They can. But it's a lot more challenging, right? Absolutely. So, the, you know, the, the world is changing and you have to think about that differently. You have to think about, um, you know, you, I mean, obviously I'm not suggesting that anybody needs to do something or make a movie about, um, about you know, another person's culture if it's not something that, you know, is inherently passionate to you. But you do need to think about the way the world is moving and what kind of movies are going to be allowed to be made and with whom. Um, and you need to put together your team based on that. So follow the funding because that's, you know, that's how you're going to get to where you want to be. I would just add to that, like be prepared to fail. I think the failure, failing upward is probably like my best skill set. Uh, <laughs> like uh, from, I think 2005 to probably 2015 when I stopped doing it quite so much, I probably wrote somewhere between 12 and 30 music video treatments a year of which I would maybe get three. And uh, countless uh, Arts Council grants and Nova Scotia Arts grants of which I think in 20 years I received one. Um, and not take those no's and those rejections as an indication that like the story that you wanna tell is not valid, but do listen to why you didn't get it and make those relationships with the people on the other side, uh, whether it's the jury feedback or the administrators or the people at AFCOOP, the joint AFCOOP. If like, you don't know what AFCOOP is or the Center for Arts Tape is, find out. Uh, because 
you know, it's not an indication that that what you're trying to do won't happen, but you do have to have a thick skin as an artist, period. Um, you know, there are the odd geniuses out there who just like somehow land on their feet and make amazing, you know, sound installations out of the gate. Uh, and, uh, but we can't all, we can't all be that. Uh, we, so, you know, find the people who you can support in, in their art making and surround yourself with creative process. Cause then it eventually will, you'll, you'll be up eventually. You could become a member of Screen Nova Scotia too. I don't know if Jason knows who we are, but, um, but you could become a Screen Nova Scotia member and, and we could probably help too. That. <laughs> <laughs> uh, for me I'd go back to what Jerry Ferguson said um, in 1992 which was uh, art making is 95% um, perspiration 5% inspiration and so I would definitely say hard work um, and I'd also say to echo what um, my fe fellow panelists have said which is uh, it's about relationships uh, the reason that I broke in uh, to the industry in Nova Scotia is uh, probably the one person I knew in the, in the industry was the business agent for IATSE at the time. Um, and I was uh, between my second and third year at Simon Fraser University. And I called her up and I, I she's from the same town as me. And I said, I, I want to work in the industry. And she said, what department? And I said, well, I want to be a filmmaker. What department? <laughs> And uh, I said, well, I want to be a director, so I guess uh, some, somewhere close to where a director is, so <laughs> camera. And she helped me get uh, the camera treaty job on Titanic that was here for three weeks. And I never looked back, and I, I decided not to continue on at film school because just what I was learning by being a technician on set was invaluable. So I would say hard work and, and relationships for sure. Um, if I can chime in with my own two cents there, uh, I am alumni of NASCAD, like um, three of you, and I for a short time worked in film, and my first job was from Marcia Connolly, who was a fellow student at NASCAD. So I think a lot of, um, we say the industry or that it's something exterior to what you're experiencing in that moment as a student. And often you can be generating projects amongst your friends together. And it may not be things that you're making a lot of money off of or that are being seen by anybody besides you guys. But um, I think that there can be something really productive about just fostering the relationships you have in the university setting first and then continuing outward to making connections because there are people within the institution who have um, connections to a broader audience that you can get keyed into. So it doesn't have to be this kind of like knocking on the door of this huge industry that's outside of your experience. You could be having a professor or somebody who's in the in the institution, like be your gateway into those kinds of things as well. But it was for me anyway. Mm -hmm. um, also just read. Yeah. <laughs> like really important to read. Uh, read all of the industry information and news that you can. Uh, know who is making movies. Know who people care. Like it, it, it's similar, what John is saying in the last panel, like, uh, you know, about art print, uh, there's million, there's trades out there that are telling you every minute who's got a grant, who is directing the ne this next thing, what actor is impressive in what way. And it doesn't all need to be that top 1%. Like find the things that you're interested in and, and be knowledgeable about it. Cause it's as much as it's an art, it's also a craft and an industry and a community. And so if you don't know what's going on and you can only name Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie, like <laughs> you like do your homework. It's not going to happen in school. It's going to like read, read the trades. It's like kind of a trope, but read, read the trades. Like, Playback deadline, Hollywood reporter variety. The list goes on. Um, thank you to everyone. I'm going to open up the floor to questions. If that's, uh, something anyone has a question. Uh, I have a question. Just 
for the YouTubers watching at home. Um, so if you're going to hire a you know student fresh out of school as a trainee, what are the qualities you're looking for? Someone who has a non approved driver's license. Driver's license? <laughs> <laughs> Heartbeat? <laughs> I think good communication skills is probably one of the top things and showing and showing that there's some uh, energy around like knowing what you're supposed to be trying to do, you know, spell check your emails, uh, like s call the unions first, understand the mechanisms that you should be going through to, un to get a basic training courses, like just at the bare minimum, a set etiquette class. Um, and probably a health and safety class, um, basic, basic stuff that, you know, I think has been codified a lot better in the last, uh, 10 years, thanks to people like Laura. Um, but other than that, uh, just good basic listening and communication skills, I think are the main things, you know, like there's a, there's a tradition of. Um, mentorship and apprenticeship in this industry that, you know, it might be the most codified and perfect in Germany, but it still exists here on, on some level where um, whoever you get dropped into work under uh, feels some sense of obligation to teach you how to do things well in the way that they would like to be seen and the standards that they'd like to uphold. And so the, that the on the job training that you get in this industry is pretty rare, I think, in comparison to other, you know, trades that are large workforces. Uh, uh, the uh, sort of so, I think that having good listening skills and and showing the ability to like showing some energy that you have some energy around learning and absorbing is probably the main thing. And a driver's license. I I, I basically echo everything Jason just said because it is. Uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, puts me in mind of a Neymar Toll's book called uh, Rules of Civility, <laughs> but it's about listening and communicating and making that first contact. So you're stepping out here and maybe you come and knock on the DGC door and come in and learn about what the categories are that we represent, the IATSE, uh, 667 is the camera <clears throat> locals, 849 is the, is the technicians local, and just sort of seeing, uh, observing, but <clears throat> uh, as you're going through that process, um, engaging in those agents or using your agency yourself about asking questions and being um, uh, informed. Um, so the skills of, of being a good listener, being responsible um, <clears throat> are all necessary elements, um, but illustrating uh, uh, curiosity and a dedication are all things within the process as you're going through that sends up little markers for people like ourselves to go, oh, that person's engaged, or oh, they knew about that, or so the history that you're looking for, or the, um, <clears throat> or the where do you go, are all sort of part of that, just uh, listening and talking, listening and talking. The network world that we're referring to starts with every conversation that you have with every other individual that's both interested in doing what you're doing and that you're extrapolating information from. And this is a, a it is a, uh, a very um, welcoming community here. I know that in my own, uh, as evidenced by uh, when I get the microphone, I can't stop talking and sometimes they run on sentences. But when I'm working <laughs> with somebody, they also hear that same dialogue, whether I'm directing or I'm ADing or I'm PMing, I'm actually always talking about what I do, how I do it, and how it affects everybody around me. And uh, in that regard, I've been very fortunate to have any number of people be my shadow or my intern or that person that's being placed on the show to work alongside Steve Reynolds to learn the directing skills. Um, <clears throat> Laura made the reference earlier, the EDI world, equity, diversity, and uh, inclusion is a massive part of this industry. Sustainability is becoming a massive part of this industry. And those factors um, all play into it. And those are the factors I like to share and talk about while I'm working, because it's something that I don't know where it came from in my family, but in my whole career, I practice that uh, 
uh, <clears throat> showing respect to everybody that I meet, no matter what role they do. Um, <clears throat> uh, an associate of theirs uh, reminded me the other day about uh, my uh, care. One of my characteristics on a set is to remember um, <clears throat> names, and I will. Uh, we could have 50 background players in the background and by lunchtime, I'll call them all by their first names. And that reference shows a sign of uh, uh, respect to them that is uh, life-changing in many ways. I've had people come up to me, Megan Banning being one, who's come up to me and said, you know, 30 years ago on the Tech War series, I was a background and you said, hey, Megan, turn over here. And I said, I wanna be like that guy. <laughs> <clears throat> it's because I just called her by her name. She did actually become him. <laughs> just, so you, just for context, the conclusion. Well, that's it. I also well, think I that it's good to point out that once you, once you get the job on a film set, there is a tricky balance there. It's a social environment, but it's also a very highly organized environment. And I think that it's really easy to get wrapped up in the chatter that maybe people who have been doing it for 30 years are sort of uh you know not necessarily as like always focused on the right thing or focused on the well-worn paths that of assumptions but i think that if you're if you want to be a student of the industry as you're getting your first opportunities to be employed in it like really read your call sheets and really learn, like see what is happening the next day, really pay attention to who does what doesn't mean that you don't get to meet everybody and talk to everybody. But if your back is to the person you're working for, or you're talking about something other than what's going on. And it's, it happened to me on, on the first set that I was on, you do locations. I did a lot of locations work. I didn't mean to slag on it earlier. Like no, I definitely, I, was not I, I, I LM several movies <laughs> and location PA many things and learned a lot from the location managers who I worked, who worked, who I worked for, uh, about the practical skills that I applied to being a producer. Um, but you know, you end up, doing something like standing somewhere with a walkie uh, by yourself with a safety vest on for 10 hours, with, like not around any people, just like hoping someone will eventually bring you like a bottle of water uh, <laughs> or relieve you so you can go to the washroom. And like in those moments, it's, it's like you can, I, I just found out really quickly that I was really bad at doing the jobs that were few and far between my moments of action because I would always mess up the one thing I had to do if there was like four hours of nothing in between. Only job I ever got fired from on a film set was being an actor's assistant, which was literally just holding his bag. Uh, and it's just because there was not enough to do. Like my brain wandered because I, and I was like, I went and talked to the union rep at the time uh, and said like, I can't do the, the boring gigs. Like what should I be trying to do? And they were like, oh, you should go work with the ADs. And that worked out much better. Um, and so it's like, you know, Learn, absorb what's going on around you because there's a lot of moving parts is a big part of it. Is there any more questions? Yeah? Um, yeah. Um, you guys kind of talked about being a student and learning about film in an aspect of university and then also talking about learning by being on set and getting that kind of experience. Can you maybe talk about it, doing it together or not doing it together and the kind of timing of those different I, I feel like um, the, and I'm not the one that should be speaking, but I just generalizing, um, I think the commentary is really about being a lifelong student, right? Because you're, you're here getting your education. Um, but if you take your eye off the ball of the bigger, broader, grand scheme of things in the industry globally and where it's going, um, you, you, you'll miss out. So I think, you know, this is one of those industries where you have to always have, you know, your ear to the, you know, to the floor and, and understand, you know, what's, what's going on out there. You're talking about working on sets while you're finishing school kind of thing. I mean, I think if you can, if you need a job either way, like I was a waiter all through NASCAD and like had to make that decision to just stop being a waiter and be significantly more poor after school in order to just do film jobs. 
And if I had had an opportunity to do something different, uh, to work consistently on sets, I, I probably would have. But the amount of work that there was, there, it just wasn't there. And it was uh, arguably harder to get into the unions in trainee positions 20 years ago than it is now. But I think that even if it's adjacent, like I was saying, like if you were, if you can't get a job on a film set while you're at working, it's you're going to ask it, then volunteer for the film festival or, you know, work at like doing something at the center for our tapes or entry level, like addition, like extracurricular education there. It's all, it's all valuable. Um, but I, you know, the nice thing about the film industry is that there's that ticker in the top corner of the call sheet where it's like, whether it's 90 days or 30 days, you can just do that one show and take on that work for that period of time. And then when it's over, you can decide, oh, do I want to immediately jump into the next thing or do I want to focus on my next semester of school? So it's kind of good in that respect. You don't have to like. It just reminds me of, I think I saw recently uh, a call sheet for Magnolia, which was day 153 of 97. <laughs> <laughs> so it is a noise and indication. That doesn't happen anymore. <laughs> I'll just, I was also a waiter uh, while here at NASCA, and I too uh, kind of gave it up, but I was, uh, I also got introduced to the Center for Art Tapes and the film co-op while here, and uh, both those enterprises were, uh, you know, opening books and mind-blowing and learning. Um, uh, but the, uh, I ended up as a PA through a NAFCU word of mouth thing that got me onto a Donovan project that I then I hadn't finished here. And so I took the choice of actually leaving, uh, not finishing, doing three months on a movie. And then I came back and did my last semester. <clears throat> so it was a, uh, uh, there were opportunities that were floating that had me change course in the middle. Oh, wait, I'm going to, yeah, I'm, oh, I'm going to jump. I'm going to learn something here or I'm going to make some money here. And so to each his own as they uh, develop over time. Right. And I, I did a similar thing where I, I was here in 92 to 94 and then uh, was working in the industry. I came back to finish my degree here. So I think uh, for everybody it's different. Um, but if there's opportunities in the industry that uh, I wouldn't pass those up, you can always come back and and I don't know how things are structured here uh, right now, but um, I benefited from both uh, being a film student and from working in the industry. I'll also just add one last thing. In the year that I graduated, nine of us out of that year went on to work in the film and television business out of a class of 43, something like that. It was a, a, an extraordinary number of people that, oh, I'm going into this. Um, and, uh, sorry to interrupt. You were saying that there are quieter periods, say in the winter time, and that the the um, productions tend to happen in spring and summer. Not always, obviously, but that can sync up to times when you're not in school. So there may be opportunities to do something during the summer that then you would leave behind and go back to school at a time when there's maybe less production, less in production. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the summer is like. Late spring is the best time to be circling to the unions and asking for opportunities, I think. And again, like if you're, you walk through the doors of Screen Nova Scotia or AFCOOP and ask what's happening and who's looking for people, there's always somebody looking for people. Even if it's just somebody who can offer you a $200 honorarium to work on their short film or their documentary, like that's, that's the tribe building that I was talking about, which you can you know, if you have to work and pay rent, I get it. But if it's just going to be, you know, I think any moment where you're just writing student loans and not in school, make stuff. Follow Film Nova Scotia and Screen Nova Scotia and AFCOOP and Center for Art Tapes online. Lots of job opportunities coming up on some of these websites, our Facebook, Instagram pages. Other questions? Thank you so much, everyone, for coming, and I hope we all had a wonderful time.